Welcome to Etruscan and Roman Art. The PowerPoints for this unit, this chapter, uh, will be divided into four sections. So hopefully each one will be um, small enough that easily digested and easily put into your schedule so you can work around that. <clears throat> so um, I'm sure you're familiar with Romans, but maybe not so Etruscans, and we're going to change that today. So I find that culture uh, quite fascinating. So let's look at our map. We saw in when we were in Greece that uh, in greater Greece, there were Greek settlements down here in the boot of Italy. <clears throat> so don't forget that. The Etruscans were a different culture and they lived up here in the north part of Italy and they were a confederation of 12 different cities. Some of them are indicated on the map like Arezzo, Chiusi, Volci, Tarquinia, Cervetidi, Vetia, and Perugia. There's more, of course, um, but they were up here in the north. In between the two, uh, there was a group of people called the Italics. They're not much to talk about right now, but they will become quite significant a little bit later. <clears throat> so the Etruscans were living in the north at the same time that the Greeks were in the south. And there's a, quite a bit of contact that seems to be friendly. The Etruscans adopted a lot of things from Greece. They were very fond of Greek wine, so they imported a lot of that. They imitated their culture in many ways, as, as you will see. Um, one major difference that we will see is that it appears that Etruscan women have a slightly more elevated role in society. And I'm just going to say it appears. Um, they were prehistoric, or they, they are historic. They had writing, but nobody has translated the writing. Their writing imitated Greek letters, so uh, you can sort of read the letters, but for getting meaning out of them, it's not really possible. <clears throat> so uh, we're going to see a lot of similarities between the two cultures, and we're going to start by looking at a temple. This is a model of an Etruscan temple. So there are no surviving Etruscan temples, but what did survive is a very detailed description of an Etruscan temple by Vitruvius, who was a Roman architect um, and scholar. So the way he described it, this model was made based on that, on his verbal description. So right off the bat, you're looking at this and you think, oh, it looks like a Greek temple. And you're right. Um, there were parts of it that are very Greek like these columns on this porch. That looks Greek. This pitched roof. Yeah, that's that's Greek with the gable on the front. Yes, but there are a lot of things that are different. And one significant thing is that their sculptures are placed on the roof. We did not see that in Greece at all. The Greek loved their sculptures, but they placed them in the pediment in this triangular area here. So a little bit closer to human space and not hovering up above. Um, another difference with between Etruscan and Greek is that it's up on a higher platform, uh, necessitating the use of stairs to enter the temple. And that means that you cannot climb up onto the platform from anywhere around the perimeter, which you could in Greece. And um, another difference, which I think is very significant, is that there are three chambers here, or three cellas, and they appear to have been occupied by images of three different deities. So in Etruscan culture, the deities share temples. And I like to ask my students, because many of them have read some Greek mythology, if that's sounds like any Greek gods, if they were, uh, if they could imagine them sharing a temple with two other gods, and the, <laughs> I get a lot of vigorous head shaking. No, absolutely not. Uh, the Greek gods, as they are described in the mythology, are very possessive, very vain. Um, they want a lot of attention. They all think that they are the, the best. So you wouldn't see that happening. <clears throat> Now here's a plan of that same temple 
described by Vitruvius. So you can see those three cella here, these three chambers, and the, uh, the pro style of the colonnaded porch there. And this is called the Apollo of Vei, and it's a surviving sculpture that likely was placed on the roof of a Etruscan temple. So he's called Apollo because the Etruscans, among the many Greek things they adopted, they adopted the pantheon of the Greeks. They, to them, the Greeks were just awesome. So they brought the, the Greek deities into their own world. They already had their own deities, but they brought in Greek ones, and uh, this, this was called Upulu, but it's clearly Apollo. <clears throat> So um, let's look at some of the differences. So unlike the Greek sculptures, this guy is wearing clothes. So he's not nude. That's the first one. The second one is that his pose is quite different from, say, the Koros. Let's look at a different one here, a little bit better. He's got his arms outstretched, which has led to them being broken off. And he's striding. He's got uh, his foot, feet are widely separated. So he seems to be swinging his arms and striding. That's different. Another difference is his material. He's made of clay or terracotta. And um, so he was hollow, which made him even more fragile, more brittle. So that's led to his arms being broken. And similarities are many as well. This was created at the same time as archaic Greek sculpture. So let's bring in our archaic Koros and look at them side by side. So the characteristics of archaic Greece male sculpture are uh, these bulging eyes and this little fake smile. And here we have semi-bulging eyes and a little fake smile. Long dressed hair, long dressed hair, headdress on this guy. So those are the similarities, and that's not a coincidence. They were neighbors in Italy. So, <clears throat> but the Etruscans certainly brought their own ideas to it. Here's where again they were neighbors. So this shows the map of Greater Greece, and the red settlements. You have to remember were Greek. So the Greeks were up here in southern France. They were on Corsica and Sardinia. And the Etruscans are up here. Um, so there's contact. There is no doubt. There's lots of contact. Now, here's another aspect of Etruscan culture that is interesting. This is uh, a cista. So the Etruscans developed bronze casting, bronze craft. And they used it quite a bit. So this is a container, like a bucket. And it's about two and a half feet tall. It has figures on the handle. So these little three figures on the top are actually what you would grab hold of to lift the lid off of it. Um, and this, this bronze, okay, all of the different cysts have different types of handles. They're very interesting. There's just three standing figures. But the body of the cysta has incised lines, and these are also interesting because sometimes they illustrate different myths or different stories, um, most of which have been identified. This one on this cysta, for example, is from uh, one of the stories of the, the Greek story of Jason and the Argonauts. And you can clearly see here a man tied to a tree. So what would a cista be used for, this convenient, um, very large container? Well, it would have been used by a woman, and a woman who wanted to look nice. And she would keep in it all of her things, all of her tools and her implements she needed to groom herself, and included in that are mirrors. So she would have in here a bronze mirror. And it was made in a very in a style very similar to the Sista, where it was cast of bronze. One side would be completely flat and shiny and polished to a high gloss so that it would reflect her likeness. And the other side would have 
in size decoration, a story or an image of some sort. So there, there's a lot of craft going on here. Also in the cistus, she would keep her combs, her hairbrushes, any cosmetics or perfumes that she used, she would keep in here. Then when she was done getting herself ready for the day, she would put everything back in the system, put the lid on it. So um, we have several cistus that have survived and several mirrors. And the reason for that is that there was a very lively funeral culture in Etruscan uh, society. And this is just an example of a tomb. We're going to look at it in greater detail, but um, it represents uh, what is thought to perhaps echo the form of an Etruscan home. So the Etruscans believed in an afterlife where stuff came in handy, so a woman would obviously need her sister and her mirror and her comb forever. So that's why they survived, because they were buried in tombs. And speaking of tombs, now we're going to look at Etruscan cemeteries, and this is uh, perhaps the best known of the Etruscan cemeteries, and it's called the, the cemetery is named Banditacha. It is near the Etruscan town of Cevetri. So Cevetri was the city of the living, and Banditacha was the city of the dead. Um, Another word for city of the dead is necropolis down there. So they are really like small towns. They have streets and roads leading out to them. The major road would have connected Banditacha with the town of Cervetiri. Um, and there are tombs of different styles, of different modes of construction. So the, the ground here had very shallow topsoil, and under that was a, a very deep strata of tufa, which is a stone that is fairly soft, and the Etruscans used the tufa to carve their tombs, to build their tombs. So these mounds, which are very notable, uh, would have held three or four separate tombs. So there's an entryway, you can see it there, and it would lead into a chamber. And then a later construction is this thing that looks kind of like a motel for the dead, um, which is just sort of a string of chambers in one big, long structure. And, um, and then there are other tombs, like the one I'm going to show you, which is completely underground. It's just like, kind of like a root cellar that was dug underground. This is a, a view from the street at Banditacha, looking down the street of the dead. Uh, and you can see the mounds close up. I don't know how much of the mound would have actually been on top of the tomb at the time the Etruscans lived there and how much was just accumulated dirt over the centuries, the millennia. But there are definitely mounds today. So this is the tomb we saw briefly, and this, uh, I told you, we'd take a deeper look at it. This was carved down into the ground like the, a giant root cellar, and it's thought to represent the form of the Etruscan home. It's called the Tomb of the Reliefs because it only simulates grave goods. Um, we know that they did carry wine jugs and cista with them to the afterlife because a lot of these objects have been found in graves but this was fake stuff so all around the walls there are reliefs that were just made of plaster and left on the walls on this pier over here for example you can see a little animal you can see a rope some machete type tools a jug up here um and over here, more tools, more accessories, perhaps all intended for the dead person to just look at and feel like, oh, I got my stuff. I'm good. Shields up here, more bottles. So the whole place is decorated with these objects. And look straight back at that little chamber. Um, that, that represents where a living person would have slept in a real Etruscan home. But here in this cemetery, this is where the dead sleep. So in a home, this sunken floor is where the fire would be, in the, and then above it in a home would be an opening for the smoke to escape. But of course, there's no fire here in the tomb. 
and then all of the living would occur on this raised ledge, this platform. This is where you would do your food preparation and your dining, etc., and sleep in your little bunks on the side. So let's look at that closer up. So here's the resting place of the dead with two pillows, a little stack of pillows made of stone. And uh, lower than the opening, we have a little bench underneath with a couple of figures. Um, this figure's on the bench. It appears to be a merman with two tails. I'm sure he has an identity. I'm sorry, I don't know it, but I think he is, looks like he's the ancestor of the Starbucks mermaid, who also has two tails. And in front of him, standing on the floor, is a three-headed dog. And again, any student familiar with Greek mythology, that should ring a bell, that Hades, or the afterlife, was guarded by a vicious three-headed dog. This guy looks kind of tame, but... Um, He's got three heads, so I'm going to say he's Kerberos. And on the bench, my favorite part here, this little sign of similarity. We've got a pair of sandals, and they look like flip-flops. You can see this little strap that goes over the top of the foot and a little strap that comes down between the big toe and the next toe. So I love the flip-flops. So this is... Um, this was the form, one of the forms of tombs that was at Bonditach and Cerveteri. But another Etruscan city, Tarquinia, had a different type of tomb that gives us a, a more colorful look at the past, at, at Etruscan life and Etruscan beliefs. Uh, Tarquinia had lots of painted tombs, and we're just going to look at a couple. There are several, there are so many paintings that survive, but we're just going to check in on two of them. The first one is the tomb of the augur. And an augur is a fortune teller, somebody who can tell what's going to happen before it happens. And the Etruscans were kind of obsessed with this. We don't know a lot about their belief system, but we do know that this was very important to them. And it's probably called the tomb of the augur because these two men here on this wall seem to be focusing, one hand on their forehead, the other hand outstretched toward this golden door. Um, my interpretation of this is that, that the door is a door to the afterlife, and these men are trying to see what is beyond that door. They're trying to see into the hereafter. And another wall in the tomb of the auger shows another auger over here, this man is reaching out a hand toward these birds, and reading birds was another form of augury where um, an augur could look at the direction that birds fly, um, how many there are, and he interprets them. He gives all of that meaning uh, for good or ill or various omens. But another thing here in this, tomb that I think is more interesting perhaps is this this couple that dominates this this slide here this image and that is uh, as you can clearly see there are two men who are nude and they are wrestling um, they are wrestling as a form of entertainment at a funeral ceremony so the funerals seem to be celebrations and there are many representations of this in a Etruscan tomb. So you have to take my word for it, that they seem to be almost like a big community-wide festival where there would be music and dancing and feasting and entertainments like wrestlers wrestling. So that's what you get here. It is also thought by scholars that the wrestling at funerals in Etruscan culture will evolve into the gladiatorial games of Rome. I don't know, but I'm just reporting that. So here's another tomb, and this one just emphasizes what I told you about the whole idea of the funeral. And this, around the four walls of this room are, the, are people celebrating. There's dancing, music, and it's called the Tomb of the Triclinium, 
because a triclinium is a couch. It's an elevated couch for dining. So people back here on this wall are lounging on a triclinium and they are eating and drinking at the funeral feast. On this wall, we've got people being a little more active. A man on the left is playing a musical instrument like a harp or lyre. A woman in this long dress, and very short hair by the way, is dancing. This man is dancing, raising the roof. See his hands, his gesture up there. And another woman in a long dress is dancing here. So this is part of the great festival of the funeral. And speaking of festival, here we have a sarcophagus. A sarcophagus is a container for the remains of the dead, either uh, interred like a, a whole body or ashes. So this is a double sarcophagus that would have been would have held the remains of a man and a woman, probably married, and they are shown resting on a triclinium and feasting. So they're also happy. They have smiles on their faces, these nice archaic smiles. And they seem to be joining in the party that's going on all around them. We have to use our imagination. So look at the positions of the hands. This man's left hand is flat. I can easily imagine a plate. His right hand, I could see a cup in there, a goblet. And the woman's hands also positioned as if she's holding something to eat. So they are feasting with the people and probably they really had real food on them originally. Um, I put it in red down here that this is made of clay. This will be a quiz question, terracotta or clay. Um, same material as the Apollo of Bae. It's, it's what the Etruscans had. I don't think they had discovered their marble quarries yet, so they make um, most of their stuff out of clay. And here's another one very much like the one we just looked at. It's got a little different color to it, a little better preserved polychrome, um, but you can see it's the same idea. The, the husband and wife enjoying each other's company in the afterlife and feasting with all of the people who came to their funeral. Um, but my favorite detail, I enlarged it here, is the woman's shoes. She's got sneakers on. She has these little lace-up shoes that are very cool. So now you've seen the Etruscans had flip-flops and they had sneakers. They're just like us, really. They like to party. They like to dance and raise the roof. Yeah, there's no difference. This is the end of our first part, so stay tuned for the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire.